Hello and welcome to another video of the Structure Matters series. Here we explore the importance of protein structures and introduce different biophysical techniques. My name is Richard Huang. I'm a field application scientist at Redshift Bio. And today we'll go over particle sizes and dynamic light scattering. Why do we care about the size of the proteins? Well, it's simply because the size can tell us a lot about the protein structure, especially its tertiary and quaternary structures. Now let's take a look at hemoglobin as an example here. The monomer of hemoglobin is a globular protein with a diameter of 3.2 nanometers. However, under natural physiological condition, hemoglobin is actually a tetramer comprised of four identical monomers, and its overall diameter is increased to 5.6 nanometers. As we can see, the size of the protein can be an indicator of its correct multimeric state. Antibodies are relatively large proteins. An example here is IgG1, which is 10 nanometers across. Beta-rich proteins like this are susceptible to aggregation when misfolded or unfolded and eventually form disease causing amyloid beta aggregates that can be as large as hundreds of nanometers. So the size can also easily indicate whether there's aggregation going on in the proteins. Now there are also proteins that naturally form oligomers of various sizes. Alpha B crystalline is the most abundant protein in human islands. And being able to exist in different multimeric states is extremely important for alpha B crystalline to maintain its function to prevent protein aggregation in the human eye lens, which can potentially lead to cataracts. Therefore, knowing the size information of the protein is critical to understanding its structure and predicting its function or activity. Now, before I jump into explaining dynamic light scattering, let me introduce one key concept, Brownian motion, which is the fundamental basis of DLS. Brownian motion describes the random movements of a particle in a medium such as gas or liquid. The randomness of Brownian motion comes from the collision of the particle with its surrounding molecules. In the context of macromolecules such as proteins, they collide with solvent molecules and move at random directions in solution. The speed of such movements depend on the size of the particles. Smaller particles move or diffuse faster, and larger particles move or diffuse slower. So how does DLS work? In the typical DLS measurement, particles in a solution are exposed to a laser. Then the scattered light after hitting the particles is measured directly by a detector. The intensity of the light being scattered will change over time as the particles continue to diffuse. The speed of these intensity fluctuation depends on the diffusion rate of the particles. As we introduced earlier, larger particles diffuse slower, and this translates to slower fluctuations of the intensity and vice versa. So now, how do we use this information here to calculate the size of the particles? Well, in DLS, the snapshots of these scattering signals are taken rapidly one after another and compared back to the original signal, which is signal B in this example. Between each snapshot, usually within nano to microseconds, the signals are always pretty similar and well correlated. But as the delay time gets sufficiently larger, the similarity of the signals begin to decrease and eventually there will be no more correlation with the original signal. For larger particles that diffuse slower, the correlation signal loss will take longer. For smaller particles that diffuse faster, the correlation signal will decay faster. And as we can see here, this process is plotted as a correlation function. This is then used to calculate the translational diffusion coefficient or simply the speed of the particles. From here, the hydrodynamic size of the particles is calculated using Stokes-Einstein equation. With the calculated hydrodynamic size of the particles, 
DLS usually outputs the size distribution of all the particles in the sample. Overall, DLS is a great tool that provides fast measurements of the exact size of your samples and can easily pick up large size disparities in your samples, such as protein aggregates. Like other techniques, DLS has both its advantages and limitations. And here are some of the highlights. DLS is a non-destructive technique, meaning that the samples measured can be recovered for future use. Each DLS measurement is usually within only a few minutes, so very fast measurements. The volume required can be as slow as 3 microliter. And also DLS covers a very good size range from 0.1 nanometer to 10 microns. Some of the disadvantages include low resolution, so particles that are only a few nanometers apart usually cannot be distinguished by DLS. DLS treats all particles to be spherical in shape, so if the particles are not spherical, the accuracy might not be guaranteed. Also, DLS is more sensitive to larger particles such as aggregates or dust and less accurate for smaller particles. And finally, particles need to be in homogeneous dispersion for the measurement. This concludes our introduction to dynamic light scattering. Thank you for watching this video. Again, I'm Richard, and if you want to learn more about other biophysical tools, check out more videos on our Structure Matters website. Take care.